Hello, thanks for joining us on this week's episode of Wise Content Creates Wealth. You've heard that content is king. Well, wise content rules the world. This podcast is about understanding how you can make and utilize con wise content to improve your financial success and the bottom line of your business. I am Joseph Franklin McElroy, and I am a marketing technology expert who has built a multi-million dollar company, and I'm also an award-winning content producer. My company is Galileo Tech Media, a leader in providing wise content and smart SEO services. Wise content and SEO, smart SEO focuses on content that incorporates search science, behavioral science, artificial intelligence, data, and process to make content that converts better and gets better rankings. Since 2014, we've provided a suite of global clients with quality wise content and smart SEO services, helping them get maximum visibility in search, organic search, a growing social media presence, and more effectiveness in converting traffic to sales. We specialize in travel and hospitality, as well as companies that have multiple locations. Besides this podcast, we run, a monthly, we run monthly webinars. We ask leaders and scientists and psychologists and others to expound in depth about subjects related to wise content and smart SEO. Read more about us at GalileoTechMedia.com and sign up for our informative newsletter that will let you know about our upcoming episodes and webinars. Our agenda today is how wise content avoids content overload and breaking through the noise to bring it, attract attention. But first, I'm going to give you a little bit of news like I usually do. I was reading the uh, Content Marketing Institute's uh, you know, blog on where they give up, they give lots of interesting things about uh, content. And I, I thought uh, there was a nice tip in there about how to get people to read through your entire email newsletter or an email that you're sending out to them. Uh, and it's, it's, it was clever. There's a, there's a, um, there's a real estate um, uh, email going out called Morning Brew. It's pretty popular. Uh, and it's, uh, and, and they, they've been, uh, they send out a, um, a, a, a newsletter that capitalizes on the Sunday real estate review that, you know, there's been a tradition around, uh, you know, newspapers for a long time, you know, and it was, uh, you know, it was, um, and basically, um, it, it, is, it was meant to publicize open houses so people can go and see prospective homes in, in person. Um, but now these are mostly online. So it's a popular newsletter and they send it out. So they feature a housing that's unit for sale in, in this thing. Um, and then and, and, and the details comes from some realtors or Instagram account. Uh, and then they might publicize an open house and really you know, give a glowing description of it right at the top of the newsletter about this house and, and things like that. Um, and then at the end of their description, they'll say, uh, so, so how much, so how much for your next project scroll to the bottom for the price. So what was cool, great about that is, is that they made it, they made some people, so they wanted to, they made something very attractive that people would, would want to know what the price of that house would be, but to find out instead of putting it in there, they have to scroll all the way down through the newsletter to get to the bottom. All right, and it's sort of a gamification of their email. So they have to scroll to the bottom to get to find out the price, which they're gonna to wanna to do. But it also means they're probably gonna read and see a lot of the rest of the newsletter as they go down. So I think that's a great, clever, um, um, you know, approach to making it happen, uh, making it, um, you know, making uh, people read the newsletter. It's, it's actually uh, creates a curiosity gap um, uh, the, as to so that people get curious about what the price is, and it, but if you don't give them the answer right away. During that gap, you get them to look at other things. So anyway, that, that's the the tip for the day. Um, so our guest today is Danielle Strouther. Now Danielle is a product product marketer at digital marketing company at Zuma. With years of experience copywriting and creating content for Search Engine Journal, PPC Hero, Technopedia, and more. Away from a, the screen, you know, you'll find her working on crafty projects or dancing around a pole. Uh, I'm sure there's a story there. Say, hi, Danielle. Welcome to the show. <laughs> hi. It's great to be on. Thank you for inviting me. Oh, sure. So you're over in, uh, in Britain, right? 
Yes, I am. I'm near Nottingham, so near Robin Hood land. Cool. So uh, that's good. It's uh, and you're about to head out for the Friday evening, so that'll be uh, quite a blast, I'm sure. Uh, uh, I don't think you do the the pole dancing in the clubs. You're a, you're a fitness enthusiast, right? Yeah, it's more of a fitness thing. I'm not in the clubs. <laughs> <laughs> All right. And I saw on Twitter that you just made yourself a dress. Is that part of the crafty side of you? It is. Yeah. I mean, I get probably a lot of criticism from my other half that I can never sort of pick a medium. So like, um, I buy a lot of crafty stuff. So like one month I'm like, oh, I'm into watercolors now. I'm going to do watercolors. And like my latest thing was like, I'm going to learn how to make clothes. So I have just this week finished my first dress. So that is my sort of flavor of the month at the minute is dressmaking. Uh, well, it was very cute, and you and you, <laughs> and you uh, modeled it nicely online. It was very charming, actually. Um, so uh, I think that I, I, I'm, you know, I am an artist as well as being a business uh, and technologist. And I actually have some pieces in museums, but I have been accused of the same thing of trying too many different kinds of uh, arts. You know, yeah. crafts, right. I like to make stuff. So, but I, I think it's uh, healthy for the soul and and for your life to you know to be creative like that. Oh, uh, definitely. Cool. And uh, what's your next one you're going to take up? Have you thought of that yet? <laughs> um, in terms of medium, I'm not sure. Uh, uh, I kind of got some lino printing stuff recently, so it might be that. But I might stick with the dressmaking for a little while first. <laughs> Well, you know, I made the mistake during this COVID is I decided, well, I'm going to really learn how to make cocktails because everybody seemed to be drinking, right? <laughs> so I learned to make cocktails. But now the mistake is, is that when I go to the parties, I have to stand behind the bar and make drinks. <laughs> oh, yeah, you're so you're... good. You make great drinks. You're so good. <laughs> Yeah, so, yeah, not working the parties rather than enjoying them. <laughs> yeah, so sometimes the craft could have a, a, a side effect you didn't anticipate. <laughs> uh, so I see that you have a master's from the University of Nottingham in film and television studies. And I you did. A, and you wrote a thesis called Quality and Risk in Contemporary U.S. Television. What did you find out about that? <laughs> yeah, so um, this was around the time where Game of Thrones was still at the height uh, uh -huh. before it obviously took that final season. But um, it was the time where everyone was talking about this concept of quality TV. So it was things like Game of Thrones, like Broadwalk Empire, like The Sopranos, that they were sort of like a next level genre of TV that's different from what you see. So my thesis was basically exploring what that is sort of saying, well, is this a genre? What is it? What makes it quality? And is it this idea that they take risks? Is that what makes them quality TV? So that was the general uh, subject of my thesis. And I did look at things like Game of Thrones, but I also looked at um, Netflix and House of Cards again before that kind of uh, took a different turn. So <laughs> this was quite right, a while. Yeah. <laughs> But yeah. So, so it was a good excuse to watch a lot of television then. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Definitely. And, and what was your conclusion? Uh, my conclusion was that basically, yeah, this idea of quality was something that took risks, but only to a certain extent. And um, if something was too risky, it wasn't quality anymore. So probably Game of Thrones is the best example of it. Like they took risks, people love it, but then when they do something a little more controversial and risky, sort of some of the um, the rather sexual scenes that they've had, uh, it again got complaints. That's too risky. So um, almost TV shows had to straddle this acceptable risk category in order to be quality. Mm -hmm. Is that, would you, would you say that that's the same thing in, in any kind of content, right? Yeah, yeah, basically. So that yeah. was sort of my foundation, you know, push the boat out, but don't push it out too far because people uh, don't like that. So let me ask you then, how did you end up in business and then at Zuma? Yeah, so basically I did my film studies degree and the next logical step for me was like, right, I'm going to work at a video production company. So I found a small one in my area and I worked with them for a while and then moved on to a marketing agency. So I actually started just making video content 
And then from there, I went into a wider agency world and started writing all sorts of content. I started doing blogs, started doing everything else. And from there, I moved to a tech startup and gradually moved my way into product marketing, um, mainly through copywriting, which was my sort of passion at the time. <laughs> <laughs> That your that that was your craft of the of the day is learning to write uh, blog posts, right? <laughs> yeah, definitely. It's not just craft that I changed my mind in. I think it's um sort of all sorts of content I've dabbled in over the years. Cool. And what was your what, what's your favorite um, uh, blog post to date? Um, one of my favorite ones was a research piece I did about working from home as the pandemic hit. I did a lot of um, basically a lot of surveys, gathered a lot of data and turned this into this big piece about how people prefer working from home, how they actually do work from home and like, would that be the future um, as we first went into the lockdown? And it was something that was like... I actually really enjoyed it at the time and it actually got quite a lot of PR buzz around it as well and um, not to brag but it was featured in Forbes as well which was a definite highlight for me. <laughs> oh, fabulous all right and, and did you conclude that, that we're going to continue to have a lot more working at home after the COVID is over? Yeah at the time the co general consensus was that it offered people a lot more flexibility and freedom to sort of work the way they prefer so in an office although that's really good for collaboration and social and um, side of things there's not a lot of room to set your own schedule like you a lot of people often feel like they're being watched or they have to clock in and out at a certain time rather than be based on productivity right. and being at home allows them a little bit more freedom and the chance to do that well, that's great. You know, Galileo was founded on uh, everybody working from home. We have never had offices. Oh, uh, wow, yeah. Yeah, so our, since 2014, that's how we've worked. And we've done some amazing big stuff, um, you know, and, uh, um, and it's been good. So when we come back, we're going to talk about this concept of content overload. You're listening to Talk Radio NYC at www.talkradio.nyc. Now broadcasting 24 hours a day. Are you a conscious co-creator? Are you on a quest to raise your vibration and your consciousness? I'm Sam Leibowitz, your Conscious Consultant, and on my show, The Conscious Consultant Hour, Awakening Humanity, we will touch upon all these topics and more. Listen live at our new time on Thursdays at 12 noon Eastern Time. That's The Conscious Consultant Hour, Awakening Humanity, Thursdays, 12 noon on talkradio.nyc. Are you interested in having a better relationship with yourself, others, and God? Greetings. I'm your host, Dr. George Andow, for the show, A Journey Through Into Awareness. On my show, we journey into the awareness that the mind of God is the true seat of our personal consciousness. We join together each Monday at 7 p.m., so tune in on Talk Radio NYC. Did you know that nearly one in five adults in the U.S. battles mental illness? Hi, my name is Albert Dabba. I'm the host of the show Extra Inning. Extra Innings, I discuss the topics of wellness, mental health, and the experience of surviving multiple suicides within my family. Listen live every Monday at 6 p.m. Eastern to Extra Innings for discussions with sports figures, artists, mental health professionals, and many others. That's Monday at 6 p.m. Eastern on talkradio.nyc. Hi, I'm Graham Dobbin. Join me every Thursday evening for the Mind Behind Leadership here on talkradio.nyc. We speak to people from business, sport, military and politics, all around what makes a great leader. The personal experiences of what's worked and, maybe more importantly, what hasn't worked. So, that's 7 o'clock every Thursday evening. The Mind Behind Leadership here on talkradio.nyc. Listen to real stories of real leaders. <laughs> You're listening to Talk Radio NYC. Uplift, educate, empower. Hello, 
this is Joseph Franklin McElroy back with the Wise Content Creates Wealth Podcast with my guest, Danielle Strother of Adzuma. So, Danielle, you, uh, you actually coined a phrase. That, well, I don't know if you coined it, but you used a phrase uh, that piqued my interest. and I'm, I'm wanting to find out more about it. What, do you, what, is, what is content overload? Yeah, um, I didn't coin this one, so I'm not going to create credit for it. But content overload is basically this idea that we are definitely now that we're in this digital age, surrounded by content almost all of the time. So we are we can go on our phones and in probably five minutes, we can basically be interacting with about five blog posts. You can go on TikTok and you can watch 20 videos in that time you can go on twitter and see messages from probably about 10 brands in that space there's just so much all around us that we actually get a little bit overwhelmed we don't have a focus on one particular thing because the choice and the selection there is just so overwhelming and um, there was a a stat i read as well that basically said um the amount of data that we're just producing on a day-to-day basis growing so much that by 2025 we're going to be expected to be creating 463 exabytes and I didn't even know what an exabyte was until I heard that start (laughs) it's like way beyond gigabytes and all of that it's just an almost immeasurable number that of data that we're actually creating and um to sort of put that into a little perspective of what Escobar is, every single word ever spoken by humans only fit into five Escobites. So <laughs> we're creating hundreds more of that per day and oh putting my. it out into the world. Wow. Talk about uh, that. I mean, that's, that's, uh, that, is, that is quite amazing. So do you, uh, yeah, that's pretty, that's actually a pretty stunning number, you know, and so, uh, you know, I like to say, well, for one client, we produce 40,000 pieces of content in a year, but that's nothing. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah. So uh, it's going to become even more ex- exponential. Yeah. I mean, yeah. That's, well, I guess that's why AI is getting into the game of creating content. So do you think that this content overload is bad for business? So a little. Uh, <laughs> so there's good and bad things to everything. So we're creating so much data now because we can and being able to create and produce so many things now means that you've got so many touching points for customers if they didn't see that one post you wrote a week ago they'll probably interact with something else you've written or a video you've produced there's so many ways that we can get attention now due to this sort of content overload but on the flip side of that there's so much to pay attention to it's hard to get people to notice your business particularly if you're a small business as well because like you don't have the resources and the times to producing 40,000 content pieces a year that's a very big number so if you're only producing maybe 10 a month or something um Mm -hmm. you've got you know, a very limited chance of actually holding on to that attention and getting people to pay attention to your company. So the things that you do put out need to be almost more valuable, which then sort of in turn, like, how do you get attention, even if it is valuable? You know, mm-hmm. if people can, I mean, TikTok, I think is one of the best examples of content overload. If you just stay on that app, you'll be shown video after video after video. So how do you get people to stop and look at yours and actually take action is a very difficult process. And it's something that businesses are very much struggling with now. They can have the best content in the world, but if they don't break through that barrier, that overload, it's going to be hard for people to pay attention to them. And you have to do it like what, the first three seconds, first eight seconds, something like that. You got to, I know a little bit about TikTok. I get addicted to it sometimes. (laughs) And it's like, uh, you know, it's it's sort of a mystery. You know, I'll, I'll have, I'll do one post and, and you know, I'll get 20, 20 people that will look at it and, you know, and that's it. I'll do another and I get 50,000 people looking at it, right? Yeah. 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 Sometimes uh, it's just a look of the draw, but, it, you know, it's, it's very hard. You've got to get people almost like that. And if you yeah. haven't, you've almost lost them. 
Yeah. Uh, so I imagine that's why there's so many people out, you know, on there doing, you know, uh, the skimpy clothing, you know, leveraging their whatever, they're trying <laughs> anything to, to, uh, to, to make it, make an impact. Right. Yeah. So, um, so, so, yeah, you, you, uh, we've actually positioned wise content to be better than regular content. Right. So, yeah. and using uh, all sorts of things like behavioral science and data. So what do you think, how do you think that uh, wise content differs from good content for business? Yeah, so to me, there's sort of one difference between what's good content and what's wise content, and that is being able to get someone to take an action. So good content can be good and it can entertain you, it can get your attention, but if you just watch it and move on, it's had almost no impact on you. That's it, it's done. But wise content is different. Wise content is something that you will interact with it and then want to take action. Well, well, and that can be like a number of things for businesses. It doesn't have to be, oh, I've watched that. I'm going to suddenly buy your 5,000 pound computer. I love it, just one advert. It can be something simple as they'll follow your brand. They'll sign up to a newsletter. They'll remember you or share you like there has to be a conscious action that's involved um to make content good to wise mm -hmm. you know i um i uh I, I you know of course i agree i agree that you're speaking <laughs> you're speaking my language uh a good example for me just happened this week is uh yeah. I uh, I had we have we have really good writers and uh, and, so, and we put out a lot of content and a lot of times it's you know we actually target a keyword or something because it's timely and and we maybe not don't put as much effort into making it wise as we should and so we had a we actually did an article called a blog post called SEO for tourism right yeah um, which you know we didn't think particularly it was particularly um uh you know large traffic but it was timely and there was some search so we did it and put it up there and i noticed at the beginning of this week that um it, it got in the number one right it got in the position wow. number one for uh within just a few months it got in the position number one for that term and and, and we were getting about 500 impressions a month from google right but we only had a 33 percent click through rate now if you're in position one you know, you should be getting like a 60% click through rate, right? Yeah. So I went and 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 looked and, you know, one of the, um, you know, I just noticed that the call to action that was showing up in the search results was not as well crafted as it should be. So I modified that, but I also made it into a page and then we were getting no um, actions happening on that page too. So all I had to do is, all I had to do, we, we did was just reformat it um, to have better calls to actions. And believe it or not, within three days, we started getting, um, getting conversions. We got, in fact, we got one of the largest companies in the world in the, in the, you know, the, the, you know, the, uh, state, you know, what are called, um, short-term stays, uh, yeah. coming in through that. Right. So it's like, you just, you know, you just maybe it was like maybe an hour or two of extra work to make it wise. Right and boom, it starts becoming a, a, a generator of yeah. You know, so it was good content because it got number one in the, in the search engine, but it didn't become wise until you actually pay attention to it to get it convert. Yeah, so that's cool. All right. Yeah, it's almost like a two step. So like, is this valuable? Yes. Okay. Now, what do we do with it? What do we want customers to actually do once they've interacted with it? And that's where you get your sort of why step from. All right. So, you know, um, I sometimes get people that send me a questions and you sent me with some and uh, you gave you, you did a very, uh, you know, you did a question that's like, you know, right in your face, and, uh, you know, and it's like, you know, somewhat, uh, you know, counter counterintuitive to what everybody's doing out there. And you said you asked, is the blog dead? What's your answer? <laughs> uh, my answer to that is no, the blog is not dead, but it is very saturated and almost like misunderstood. So the blog, um, speaking sort of generally, the blog used to be one of the easiest content forms to actually create. Um, all you need to do is go online, write a few words and publish it, right? That's a blog. And in a time when people 
you know mobile phones weren't as good people didn't have video cameras like a blog compared to a video is a no-brainer it's so much easier it's so much less resources but now it's not the case and now if you've got a mobile phone you can create a video you can create a podcast there's so much more options available but a lot of small businesses get stuck in the fact that content means blog and content does not mean blog so there are times when businesses are using the blog instead of using something that their customers would engage with more and it's misused which is a shame because if it was used properly, which some businesses do, and they see massive success from blogs, is that it actually, you know, would be a lot better if they killed off their blog and did something different with it. It's about knowing which content form to use at the right time. And for a lot of businesses, that is the blog. And yes, it's very much alive in certain areas. And the example you just gave as well, obviously that blog is still very much alive and it's working well. But, you know, for some businesses, that's just, it's just not a thing anymore. Um, you know, if, um, for instance, if um, people with quite visual products are selling things, um, say if you're an artist selling your own art, you don't really want to be writing posts about, you know, the top 10 paintbrushes I'm using to create this art piece. <laughs> like, people don't care. They want to go on Instagram or TikTok or wherever it is and yeah. see you painting it. They want to see the finished results and they'll engage with that. They won't engage with a blog post. Yeah. Oh, that, that's, yeah, that's brilliant. Yeah, I agree with you on that 100%. We actually had a, a $100 million um, construction firm that we'll focus, well, as a client that focuses in on... Um, on foundation work and things like that. And um, when we did the, we did an analysis to see what kind of content to write. Well, it turns out the share of voice where people were, um, you know, consuming content was not articles. It was video, believe it or not. It was like 60% yeah. of the share of voice was in video. So that they were gonna have to create videos. All right, actually get attention in that space. And so it's interesting, you know, you have to know what people want. Yeah, uh, in your space. So that's great. So when we come back, we'll continue uh, um, this and take it a little bit into SEO. All right. You're listening to Talk Radio NYC. Uplift, educate, empower. Hey everybody, it's Tommy D, the nonprofit sector connector coming at you from my attic. Each week here on talkradio.nyc, I host a program, Philanthropy and Focus. Nonprofits impact us each and every day, and it's my focus to help them amplify their message and tell their story. Listen each week at 10 a.m. Eastern Standard Time until 11 a.m. Eastern Standard Time right here on talkradio.nyc. Are you a business owner? Do you want to be a business owner? Do you work with business owners? Hi, I'm Stephen Fry, your small and medium-sized business or SMB guy. And I'm the host of the new show, Always Friday. While I love to have fun on my show, we take those Friday feelings of freedom and clarity to discuss popular topics on the minds of SMBs today. Please join me and my various special guests on Friday at 11 a.m. on talkradio.nyc. Do you run or are ready to open your own business? Hi, I'm Jeremiah Fox. I've been operating and opening small business for the last 25 years, and I'm the host of the new show, The Entrepreneurial Web. Tune in every Friday at noon Eastern time for insights and stories on the nuances of running small business right here on Fridays at noon, talkradio.nyc. Hi, I am Joseph Franklin McElroy, host of the new podcast, Wise Content Creates Wealth. It airs on talkradio.nyc every Friday afternoon from 1 p.m. to 2. They say content is king. Well, wise content rules the world. Every episode features tools and tips for content marketing and business people telling the wise content stories of that success. Tune in every Friday from 1 p.m. to 2 on talkradio.nyc. You're listening to Talk Radio NYC at www.talkradio.nyc. Now broadcasting 24 hours a day.
Hi, this is Joseph Franklin McElroy back with the Wise Content Creates Wealth podcast. And my guest, Danielle Strouder from AdZuma. So we're talking about content overload and wise content. And you know, we've talked a little bit about some things that uh, can happen in this space, you know, the, the need for different types of content. So uh, Danielle, how do you think, um, what, what, what do you think are some good ideas to help you, to utilize co wise content to break through content overload? Yeah, um, so one of the best things you can do for content overload is just don't feel the pressure to do everything and publish so much. Um, even though like there's the temptation that obviously the more you publish, the more chances you have of customers seeing it. It's not the right approach for everyone and it can be quite a drain on resources and time. The best thing you can do is just to find the niche and find your value. So like a great example that I've interacted with is um, it's called um, Artful. So they are basically a art subscription box. It comes like every quarter, it's just filled with supplies. Now they don't have a blog, they don't have a YouTube, they don't have anything like that. What they have is an Instagram and they use it very well. And it's one of the best like examples of finding a niche that I've actually found. You know, they um, have built up this little community based on almost one picture per day that they're posting. And what it is, is just um, an example of someone's work and saying, oh, here's our daily art inspiration. You guys go and draw this thing using whatever you want. So for the maybe two minutes it takes to find a picture and say, hey, guys, today let's draw a turtle. They're actually creating something that, inspires action is getting people to get involved and then reinforcing it by posting what people have put through the stories they've built a community of people actually wanting to try stuff and that also it ties in so heavily with their branding their art box thing isn't you know they don't sell dedicated art supplies for professional people they're professional art supplies that you get randomly of a different medium every three months or whatever it is so the whole concept is you know this is art you can do it go give it a go and they've used that concept in their content of give it a go today we're drawing a dolphin go and give it a go and it's one of the best ways of finding a niche that i know about and it's just is incredible <laughs> that's you know that is a, that is um that is actually a, a sort of an insightful thing to talk about uh, is that there's now so many different mediums to express your content that you have to, you have to find the content. Uh, it's an artistic, this form follow, follow fu function is function follow form. You know, you have to find the form of your content that works best for your business. Right. Yeah. Uh, and, 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 it, and it has to, and it has to actually express your mission and your brand by just the way you chose what you're doing. That's, uh, yeah, that makes it wise. Yeah. yeah, yeah, definitely. There's like, there's steps before you even create your first piece of content. That's basically like, okay, who's our audience? Where are they? You know, what do they actually engage with? Because, you know, why am I creating LinkedIn posts if none of my customers are there and going to interact with it? You know, why mm -hmm. should I be doing that? It doesn't make any sense that it, and the more you kind of stretch your business out over all these different mediums, like the thinner your messaging is. Um, if you condense it down and just pick one or two that actually do get results, that is, you know, where you can put your time and effort into making this content wise, mm -hmm. you're actually going to see much, a, a much better results for your business. Yes. So, um, but, uh, but before I forget, is Artful in the United States or is, this, is it just over in uh, Britain? I, I, saw, I saw something I would love to have. It sounds like I love boxing. <laughs> um, I don't know at the minute. It's based uh, in Britain, but yeah, it might that. ship out. <laughs> <laughs> All right, cool. So, uh, you know, I'm, I'm big in SEO space. Uh, and, uh, you know, normally, you know, for, and it's been for years, been, you know, content, right? And uh, writing content. But now, now we're in all sorts of things. So this, you know, and 
I, you know, the way I always marketed the business was just networking really and SEO. And then I, you know, I realized networking was dead in COVID. So I had to figure out new ways to get my personality and charm out there in the world. So podcasting seemed like a good way to do that. But anyway, um, talking about SEO, you know, uh, a fundamental aspect of SEO for a long time has been keywords. Um, now when you're doing all this other kind of content, and I have my opinions on this, but I want to hear your insights into, is keyword research still important? Uh, yes. <laughs> the <laughs> simple answer is keyword research is definitely still important. Um, there's like, there's two sides to keyword research in my sort of opinion. And the first is that Keyword research without taking action gives you so many insights. You can see what your customers are searching for. You can see what's popular. You can see trends. You can see volume. And without, you know, using this to create SEO posts and all the rest of it, you can see basically what where the value is. So you can use that to influence what content you're doing. Um, but there is like another side to keyword research, which is um, a misconception that you only do it for SEO. So you do it, you look at these keywords, and you go, okay, let's make an article that has this exact keyword in and try and get it ranking, which is like, that's not good. <laughs> doesn't help anyone. You can, in, those kind of things do help, you know, with organic ranking, but there's no value there. So. The example you gave earlier is perfect. You got ranking, but until you actually change that into wise content, it didn't really do anything for your business other than sort of say, hey, look, we're number one. It's like, great, what are you doing with it though? Right. <laughs> but essentially keyword research, if you use it in the right way, yes, it's still important. It's still amazing. It gives you those ideas and it gives you those tools that you can use to turn into wise content. And if you... As well, you can use it to support, you know, SEO is not, um, it's not the sort of uh, be all and end all of your business. It's there to support you. You know, you don't do SEO to be popular or successful. You use SEO to make yourself more successful. It's a tool. Um, so if you've got content that's performing and you find a keyword that, you know, works with it, you know, use the two together, boost your content. Don't create content for SEO. Use SEO to make your content better. Yes. I, no, I think that's a, I think that's a, you know, the way, the way I view it too, you know, the, when, and I, the thing I tell people is, is you, you know, when you're doing the keyword research, you know, and you're finding keywords, you know, you got to put them, into a context when you're creating content for them, right? And like for travel, we use something called memorable tourism experiences where there's emotional factors that make the experience of travel more memorable. And so yeah. we take the keywords and we try to then surround them with emotive keywords that, that are, you know, that, 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 that provide a context and they usually end up making a great title or a great, uh, great uh, way to approach the content. Um, yeah. So, um, uh, so yeah, yeah, I'm glad you're, you're of the opinion that keyword <laughs> research is still very important. Oh yeah, keyword research is, is I've always viewed keywords as um, building blocks. And if you get your building blocks right, you can build some solid content. Right. So, you know, um, but you don't just go outside and here's a pile of bricks that I built, you know, you use them as a spark to create something great. <laughs> So you have any other uh, opinions on how wise content uh, improves and impacts SEO? Um, yeah, so sort of to expand on that, I, in my opinion, <laughs> content is, you can build such a wide content, but if you do nothing with it, you mm. know, it's almost a waste. It's like a saying that uh, people in business sort of expect things to go like, you know, if you build it, they will come. And that's just not true. If it's more like if you build it and show no one, it gets stuck inside of a cupboard that no one ever sees it. You need yeah. to lead the horse to water when it comes to marketing. There's so much content around here. You can't just expect people to just see yours. You have to show it to people. So great content works hand in hand with SEO. You know, you can use this to um, 
draw more organic traffic to your content, you can use this to basically think, oh, right, okay, how does this boost our business? If you've got something that is quite good, you know, let's use it to create backlinks and, you know, um, get your website ranking higher. And it doesn't have to be just articles or the rest of it, you know. Um, I don't know if you follow this <laughs> um, being in America, but there is um, British supermarkets at the minute. I'll go through a bit of a lawsuit. It's um, a store called Aldi that copied a caterpillar cake from M&S and they're being sued over it. Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> but, um, what Aldi did is that they sent out a series of tweets that were just making fun of the situation and that got into hundreds of articles so all they did was send a few tweets and their backlinks exploded yeah. just from this thing so it's about you know using everything to your best advantage and SEO is a way of getting people to see your content and interact with it. And, you know, it brings up another point that I think is always important to tell people. Your brand should always have a strong voice appropriate to your brand online. Yeah. Um, yes. Uh, well, cool. Well, we'll finish up uh, when we come back, talking a little bit about your, your job as a product marketer and your company. You're listening to Talk Radio NYC. Uplift, educate, empower. Are you a small business trying to navigate the COVID-19 related employment laws? Hello, I'm Eric Sauver, employment law business law attorney and host of the new radio show, Employment Law Today. On my show, we'll have guests to discuss the common employment law challenges business owners are facing during these trying times. Tune in on Tuesday evenings from 5 p.m. to 6 p.m. Eastern time on talkradio.nyc. Gateway to the Smokies. It airs on talkradio.nyc every Tuesday night from 6 p.m. to 7. Every episode is dedicated to memorable experiences in the Great Smoky Mountains National Park and surrounding areas. This show features experts and locals who expound upon the richness of culture, history, and adventure that awaits you in the Smokies. Tune in every Tuesday from 6 p.m. to 7 on talkradio.nyc. <laughs> Do you love or are you intrigued about New York City and its neighborhoods? I'm Jeff Goodman, host of Rediscovering New York, a weekly show that showcases New York's history and its extraordinary neighborhoods. Every Tuesday live at 7 p.m., we focus on a particular neighborhood and explore its history, its vibe, its feel, and its energy. Tune in live every Tuesday at 7 p.m. on talkradio.nyc. You're listening to Talk Radio NYC at www.talkradio.nyc. Now broadcasting 24 hours a day. This is Joseph Franklin McElroy back with the Wise Content Creates Wealth podcast uh, with my guest, Danielle Strouther from AdZuma. So, Danielle, as a product marketer, how do you use Wise Content in your role? Yeah. Um, so, as a product marketer, there's almost like a difference in the way I interact with customers. So, when people talk about product marketing, a lot what they're trying to talk about is basically lead generation. It's about capturing customers in that first instant, making them aware of your brand and then getting them to buy. As a product marketer, my journey is a little different. Um, I work for Azuma at the minute, which is a advertising platform. Um, it helps small businesses manage their PPC campaigns and Facebook ads, all of that. So it's an ongoing platform. You sign up and you use it. So my biggest thing that I use content for isn't to get new users on board it's to talk to our existing customers it's about giving them value in the product and 
as wise content always um, inspires action, it's actually getting them to use it. It's getting them to sort of go, hey, have you seen this feature? And then getting them to interact with it. It's about getting them to sign in each week or each month or whatever it needs to be. It's um, basically still the same core principles. I need to give them something valuable, something good and inspire action. But I almost have an advantage over the content overload in the fact that these people are already here. If I'm showing them <laughs> something in platform, I'm guaranteed to hit them. You know, if they're signed up to us, they know us already. I can send them an email and they go, oh, yes, at Zuma, I'm already registered with you. I know who you are. So it's almost got a sort of slight advantage, but in the same way, it does have its own difficulties. I, um, you know, if I hit them with a wrong piece of content, maybe they're going to be like, oh, you know what? This brand isn't for me. So it, to me, everything I show customers has to be wise. It has to be something they're interested in. It has to give them value and it has to you know, inspire action. So wise content for me is pretty much my role. <laughs> uh, you know, that's, uh, that's, you know, that's interesting. I mean, and you know what, um, I, it's been around for a little while in terms of when you're, when you're doing that kind of uh, a product marketer and you're going to do content for your, uh, your captive audience, so to speak, it can get pretty interesting. I, there was a company, I think did something like it sold laboratory, um, you know, uh, you, you know, laboratory utensils and and supplies and things like that. It was a fairly competitive market, and you know they wanted to keep their consumers engaged with them. And they found that a lot of people that use their products loved videos online, but what they loved were like zombie videos or something like that. So they started producing zombie videos. That is <laughs> amazing. I mean. <laughs> Is such a great example of what makes good product marketing as well, because there's always a temptation, like um, as soon as your customer's in, like, yay, that's done. Like, let's not think about them anymore. Let's put all of our creative ideas into getting customers. But, you know, the creativity shouldn't stop as soon as they brought and being able to make zombie videos for existing customers is amazing. <laughs> <laughs> that would be fun, right? <laughs> oh, yeah, definitely. <laughs> I wish I could do it right now. <laughs> yeah, you're already planning, right? Yeah. Yeah, I'm yeah. already making a note of that. <laughs> so uh, what advice would you give a business to create wise content? Yeah, so my biggest piece of advice to businesses is to slow down and take a step back. So um, it may seem a bit counterintuitive, but like if you're a small business and you see so much happening, the temptation is, oh, right, okay, we need this, we need this, we need to get a blog, we need a video, we need to set up our social media accounts. And it's like, no, okay, stop, <laughs> slow down and breathe and actually look at where your customers are first, look at the value and spend time just thinking about what you're going to show to people, thinking about how you actually make this wise rather than just throwing everything at the wall and seeing what sticks, because that's such a bad way to go about things. Yes. No, I mean, back in the day, SEO used to be about, um, you know, fast and furious of getting the uh, uh, blog posts up. Uh, and, you know, and, and we, like everybody else, were a little bit guilty of doing shallow, quick posts. Uh, and then over time, I came to realize it wasn't doing anything for us. Now we try to put a lot more effort into really good content, and it just makes a big difference. Yeah. Um, so I wanted to, you know, I wanted you to follow up real quick and just tell me about what what you guys do with AI and Ad Zuma, because you know I'm interested in artificial intelligence and how it modifies things. Yeah, so AI is a massive part of Adzuma. Um, like I said before, at the minute, we manage advertising accounts. So users can go in, they can connect their Google, Microsoft, Facebook, and we'll get basically optimizations, suggestions, that kind of thing that will basically tell them. And all of these are run through AI. Um, so it's basically the cornerstone of it. But it's not where we stopped. We're always developing that. And one of the new things we've actually got developed, um, actually, we've got two 
pieces that are really cool. Um, <laughs> one of them is we're creating campaigns for people and writing the adverts using AI, which is it's so smart because we're actually just creating the content for you. So this is um, if you're a new SMB, you're not, you know, you're not market, um, advertised before. You don't really know what you're doing. You can sign up to us and we'll create you an account and we'll create your first campaign. We'll write all of your adverts based on like what industry you're in, the information of your website. We pull all of that in and create it for you. So you can sign up with us and have everything created. And the second thing with AI is that we've just um, in the last month launched our SEO report. So all right. Uh, yeah, so this is, again, why I don't think SEO is dead. I think it's very useful. <laughs> cool. <laughs> um, and and but, you make suggestions about how to improve their uh, their, yeah. their their pages. Yeah. Well, yeah. That's, we, that's, that's very great. So you got to, that's nice. There's not a lot of uh, peop, you know, paid and SEO AI uh, collaborating together these days. So it's nice to see that you're doing something. Oh, definitely. And yeah. they should work hand in hand. Yeah. Uh, like our report at the minute, we we break things down to quite a simple level. So it's yeah. free report. So you can sign up for free and you'll get, you know, your keyword analysis, you get your on-site report, you get your backlink profile. Oh, wow, fabulous. So, um, yeah. So uh, I have to, I have to, to uh, it's been great to have you on the show. How do you want people to connect to you? Yeah, of course. Um, I am on LinkedIn at forward slash Danielle Strava, and I am on Twitter at Danny Strava. It's actually Danny with two I's and two N's if people complain at me for spelling it like that, but I'm so sorry. <laughs> but um, if you want to connect with me personally, but if not, I am at AdZuma if you want to connect to my company and see what we do. Okay, fabulous. Well, thank you again. It's been a wonderful conversation. No, uh, thank you for having me. Yeah. So I'm going to need to mention that we're on the talk, uh, talkradio.nyc network, uh, which is a great network. It has lots of podcasts, um, you know, to listen to every day, all live. Uh, one, one I think is following this is by Jeremiah Fox, who is host of the Entrepreneurial Web. Uh, it's a good show about small business and uh, ways to make it better. I have another podcast on this network called Gateway to the Smokies, uh, talking about the Great Smoky Mountains area. Uh, as I have a, I have a, a resort property down there called the Metal Arc Motel. Um, my company is Galileo Tech Media. F uh, feel free to reach out to us at GalileoTechMedia.com to sign up for a newsletter to find out more about wise content and smart SEO. Uh, this pod this uh, podcast is also available on. Uh, wisecontentcreateswealth.com as well as it'll be stream streamed live on facebook.com slash wisecontentcreateswealth um, and uh, it's it's always a pleasure to have people on we'll have another great guest on uh, the next Friday from 1 to 2 the same bat time same bat channel uh, and I appreciate again Danielle for being here it has been a good, co good conversation thank you thank you for having me <laughs> been a pleasure. <laughs>